and that's a big growth mindset. And you're like, well, this school is That's what I'm Right. I think I'll start. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about comparative judgment, which is a pretty big theme of this conference. There's now four presentations on it. And it's very awkward being in the middle, because I've had to adapt a little bit from anyone who's been there this morning, because you've heard lots about it. And Eva Hartel is now speaking straight after this. And anyone who goes to Eva Hartel's presentation, who is an expert in comparative judgment, is going to be disappointed in mine, <laughs> which makes it very awkward for me. Um, but to tell you the reason I'm here is actually because of Eva Hartel. Eva sent me an email asking to come and present on this because there was no one presenting on it. And we said yes, and we arrived. And it turns out that I'm not the only person who received that email, and I'm not the only person who said yes. <laughs> so. Um, I'll adjust it a slight bit and I'll try and speak a little bit differently about the rest of the presentations that are going to be there today. But just so you're aware, Donald and Ava, they've worked together. Donald is an Irish researcher in comparative judgment and Ava is obviously a Swedish researcher in comparative judgment. If you have questions, you should really direct it to them. My own background is actually in human intelligence and how that's associated with learning. Nothing to do with the educational assessment. I'm here by virtue of, I work in Sweden, and nobody else could get the flight from Ireland to come here. So, um, I'll start off a little bit. A lot of people start an ACJ discussion around that comparative judgments are much easier to make than criterion reference judgments, and they use examples of color differences, temperature differences in different countries, uh, sizes of fruit and weights, and so on. Um, so I'll try and start somewhere a little bit different, which is to describe the types of problems that exist in education. And I made a slight grammatical error before I had this as problems with education, and I spoke about this to a group of teachers, and they told me they didn't need me to tell them the problems that exist in the education system. So these are the problems that the students face, as in the actual learning tasks. And they tend to have different types of end results. So I'm not gonna ask anybody to answer any of these questions. But if a student is presented with a problem such as this, where the answer is a singular, absolute answer, as a teacher, that gives you so much information. Not so much as in a great amount of information, but it gives you a certain extent of information. The correct answer or an incorrect answer tells you the student can solve that problem. And they can get a little bit more complex. You can have problems such as this, where you get it's still an absolute agreement of answers, but the answer is, it, it is absolutely true that 2 is the correct answer if you're asked to solve for x, as is minus 2. So a student can give you either of them, or can give you both. And that gives you a little bit more information. Does a student understand how when two negative numbers are multiplied together, you give a positive number? And then you can get slightly more complicated answers. And I'm using maths here for a very specific reason you could get, find all of the angles in that object. And again, there is only so much, there's only so much of an answer a student can give once they've found all the answers to either right or wrong. But depending on which ones that the student can find, you know as a teacher what concepts they may or may not understand. And I've used maths as an example because a lot of people think that for this type of questions you don't need comparative judgment. And that's actually so slightly subjective. I'll leave you decide later on. Okay, come on. Okay. But what happens if our tasks are different? What if you're in an art class, for example, and the output that a student creates looks something like a picture? Or if you're in a music class and you want them to write a piece of music, or you want to see how well they can play a piece of music? Perhaps you're in an English class, or something where there's creative writing or an essay involved, or you're in a craft-based class like woodwork and metalwork, or various other materials-based um, subjects, and the object is to produce something. All of a sudden, we have to change our assessment question. It's no longer about being correct or incorrect. Now you're asking, is this a, a good output? And how do you even make sense of what that means? And quite often, students' work can only be meaningfully understood 
by comparisons to their peers or to comparisons to your own experience as a teacher. And that's where, for me, comparative judgment makes a lot of sense. When we're not really, I don't need to use comparative judgment if, if I know that an absolute answer exists, because I can mark or grade relative to that. But I do struggle with uh, grading these types of things. Um, and of course, every single one of these also has components that comparative judgment isn't necessarily useful for. So if you go back to the beginning, if it's um, maybe your task was to create a black and white image and not a color image, there's an absolute uh, set of feedback you can give if the student chooses to use color. Or in terms of if you want it to be accurate and you're talking about literally coloring inside the lines with younger kids. If it's writing sheet music or creating a piece of music, there is a technical language associated with that. So some of the aspects of that process for a student don't necessarily require a comparative judgment. Um, the same with, for example, English or essay writing, there is structure to an essay that you can give feedback on. And then there's other questions, perhaps the um, level of interest that you have as a reader, how captivating the piece was, or so on, that is a little bit more difficult to grade off a criteria. And again, if you're making something, how accurate it is, is quite easy to assess. Whereas how well a particular uh, product meets the needs of the, of the brief is also a different question that isn't so easy to grade. And there are many issues with assessment criteria. Anyone who was in the presentation this morning will have seen lots of them. But just two of them that I find particularly relevant are sometimes, as a grader or an assessor, the grade that we think a piece of work deserves doesn't always end up that way after we grade against the rubric. And my own background is a woodwork and technical drawing teacher. And I've often walked into grade a piece of work, and if you look at it and you think that deserves an A. It's fantastic. Then you look at the criteria that you're grading against, if you're, especially if you're an independent grader, and you didn't create the rubric yourself. By the time you got to the end of the rubric, that student might not be getting the grade that you thought it deserved initially. So, I'm sorry, just assessor, is that the person being assessed? or The, the assessor person, is the thing? person who does the assessing. Oh, thank you. Um, I should say also, because we have a small group asking questions throughout any time, um, but if you are the person assessing or, or examining a piece of work and you look at it and you think it's an A and you get your criteria, and criteria one only gets a B, and you're thinking, oh, maybe that's okay because that's not really that highly weighted, then it gets an A and you think that makes a lot of sense, I thought that would be the case then maybe there's something else that doesn't get so high a grade. And by the end of it, you're giving a student a grade that you as a professional don't think that that piece of work deserves. That's quite a difficult situation. And from talking to people, in Ireland we, I don't know how this works across countries, and, but in Ireland we have a national exam where, the, where teachers go around and they grade pieces of work against a rubric just like this. And we've asked them about their experiences and they tell us, well, sometimes the score they give on the rubric isn't necessarily the score they would have given. What they tend to do is they say, that piece deserves an A. And then they create a score sheet that lines up with their own professional <laughs> judgment. Um, so that's quite a complex issue that, that we have, especially in terms of who creates the rubric. Another thing is, we often create rubrics, but for many people who've ever taught a group of, of younger kids, they're very difficult to pre-plan what they're going to do when you give them a creative task. So if you suspect all of your students to just behave like how you conceive them to behave, and then all of a sudden a student does something different, you have to be prepared for that. So I might have expected my students all to make lovely birdhouses, but what happens if one of them decides he's going to make a birdhouse that also has a bird feeder attached to it. I hadn't anticipated that. I think that's quite a useful aspect to have in a birdhouse. And I want to reward the student for that. How do I do that if I've already created a rubric or a criteria sheet of any kind and I hadn't accounted for that already? Now I can absolutely address it in the future, but that could be quite unfair on students who maybe weren't aware of such a thing. Um, so comparative judgment works in many settings and can eliminate some of those types of issues that we can have. And how it works, and I put in these slides because I was aware that 
the other presentations don't really have a screenshot of what it looks like in practice for teachers. But this is your screen. And you're shown two pieces of student work. And this is one example. This could be a video and that could be a video. These could both be just pictures. It could be an essay. We've looked at it from grading master's thesis, for example. Um, one person that I know actually did it in terms of just audio files and, and so on. So the, the actual, once it can be digitized, it falls into the, the platform. And you get, as a, as a teacher, the option to zoom in. So perhaps this isn't particularly clear as a picture because the student put this together. So I can zoom in on just this student's work and then maybe I just want to zoom in on the picture and see what's in the picture and I can make a decision. But because I've been asked to speak about formative assessment, there are two very important aspects to this. Um, most of the research has been done with ACJ or comparative judgment. I'll explain the difference between the two in a little bit. Um, how well does it work for grading work? Very little research has been done for what it's like as a formative tool. And at one point, you are asked to create a comment on the student's work. And at another point, you're asked to create a comment on what you made your decision, what criteria you used to make your decision. And those two are absolutely critical for the formative aspect. Because if you have a student's piece of work, as a teacher, right there, you create your comment about the work, and that can be delivered back to the student. So you get to make your comments, you choose your answer, and so on. And it works off these parameter values. I won't spend too much time on this, it's just as a preamble for explaining why they're useful as a feedback perspective. They work, and this whole process works on probability. So you take a piece of work, and that piece of work will say is script A, or portfolio A, or project A. And you take another piece of work, script B, or project B, and you make a decision that B is better than A. You don't have to say by how much, just that it's better. Then you make a subsequent decision, and they've started to do this thing called chaining, which is where, and, and for anyone who has been to the presentations today, I, I, I've heard some discussion about the, the memory and meaning talk, about cognitive load theory, they have decided that it makes more sense to, we made a comparison between A and B, let's not overload the person examining this, and we'll keep B in the next judgment. So now you're comparing C to B, and your following judgment would be D to C. So you're only getting one new piece at a time. But if you make the judgment that C is better than B, it is probable that C will be better than A. And with these probabilities, we get a process that works like this. And here's where the difference between adaptive comparative judgment and comparative judgment comes in. All of the scripts are assigned into pairs to make a judgment, and half of them win the judgment, or are deemed better than the other one. After the second round, more win and more lose. I'm sorry, adaptive comparative judgment and? Comparative judgment. There's a slight difference in the title, and it's just how the algorithm functions. After six rounds of this, in comparative judgment, it stays absolutely random. You could be the best piece of work, and you could be paired with the piece at the very bottom of the rank. In comparative judgment, it stays random the entire time. In adaptive comparative judgment, after six rounds of being completely random, they start to just ask you to compare things that are similar, <coughs> and the output ends up being the same. And the purpose of it is to expedite the amount of judgments that are needed. There is literally no other difference. When it comes to a formative assessment tool, there really is no difference at all between adaptive and comparative judgment, or adaptive comparative judgment and just comparative judgment. And you get your, your rank. If you are this portfolio, if you are any of these portfolios, after a while it's no longer moving up at absolute amounts. Because if one of these portfolios was to win and I say win, win and lose sounds awful, but I'll explain that that's not actually really the case. Um, if one of these pieces of work beats one of these pieces of work in a particular judgment, it will move up 
more than if it was to do better in one of these. After so many runs, it starts to take that into consideration. I am fortunately not the person who came up with the maths behind it, so I will not be able to explain how that works. I just know that that happens. Um, but you end up with this, and each of these has a relative difference to each other. So there's a greater difference between these two than there is between these two than there is between there. And so it's not a case of just an absolute rank. It is a rank with distances between them. And those distances are all relative to each other. Because they're relative to, or I'll get to that in the next slide. <coughs> when we get to this stage, the, the, the back end, what the teacher sees, what anyone doing the assessment sees, is a rank order from best to worst, or if you want to be nice about it, from really good to just less good. Because some people don't really like the idea of there being bad work. And maybe there isn't bad work. But you get these error bars at times. And what that means is that there is some uh, contention or there's a level of disagreement about the positions of those two pieces of work. So now you'll start to get people being asked about those two pieces of work and which order should they be in. So the system is smart. Yeah? So what platform are you doing on this? This is Digital Assess. There's three. Digital Assess uses Adaptive Comparative Judgment. DPAC, which was the first one this morning, is just Comparative Judgment. And as far as I'm aware, no more marking is also just Comparative Judgment. And is it free? Uh, none of them are free, as far as I'm aware. But I don't know the cost of each one. Um, I also don't know. I think like no more marking advertises a lot that it works with English curricula. Um, I spoke to the lady today who worked with DPAC, and they don't have subject-specific emphasis, but they do want to work in higher education. Um, and Digital Assess, as far as I know, doesn't have a remit that it's willing to work in, but I don't know the cost per server space. Um, so all of them have that capacity, whether it's adaptive comparative or comparative vision, to start uh, helping the rank get uh, closer. Then you want to assign grades, and here's where the, the difficulty in terms of calling one piece of work better or worse kind of gets eased out a little bit. Because you can, if you want, if, you're, if you actually want to give a percentage grade relative to this rank, you can assign a grade. So that could be 0% and the top could be 100%. But equally, this could be 0% and that could be 5%. Or that could be 100% and this could be 98%. Everyone could deserve a grade rank. And if you want to, because none of these will get the exact same parameter value, they could be marginally different in terms of decimal points. So the reality is you could get a lot of stuff that's the same grade. So you don't necessarily have to say that the piece at the bottom is bad work. It's just that the piece at the bottom was deemed to be worse than the pieces above it. But that could still be outstanding work. And that's an important concept that a lot of people no, no, no. are almost afraid of. The other thing that, that has been done is anchor scripts, they're referring to them as. They, where people strategically put in a script or a project into this whole process that has been pre-assigned with a grade. For however that gets that grade, can be up to whoever's doing this process. But you might have a piece of work that is an A, that you have however you make that to the decision that described an A. And when you get your rank, then you can say, well, everything above that is definitely an A. Somewhere between these two would be the distinction between A and B, and so on. So there's multiple ways if you want to use this as a summative tool that you can. Some of the, the research studies have been based around that, and there's very few that are based around formative feedback, work on these next few principles. The first is that you get explicit feedback. So if you're using students or teachers as the people who are making the judgments, that will change the validity and the usefulness of the, the rank. But that's all depending on your context. But what you'll get is lots of people will view a piece of work. And lots of people will have different experiences, will have different biases. So if you're working with a creative piece, what we found when we're doing um, where, where there's pieces of furniture at a project, some people are really interested in handcraft. 
other people are really interested in the maybe the more innovative side and and the, the creative side often so we've done this with Swedish teachers and Irish teachers and, and Irish teachers were really focused on how well things were made but if it had a more ergonomic design that had a larger uh, resonance with the Swedish teachers so by having lots of people give feedback you get different people's opinions biases and perspectives on your own work which can be very helpful as a student the other way that you get feedback or and this is the, the back end screen there people write their feedback and as a teacher you can take that feedback and give it to a student to see the other option is that a student if you choose for the student to be a judge because not often not every time the teachers need to be the judge so the student gets exposure by doing these judgments to lots of pieces of work but it's not just the exposure to lots of work it's the exposure to lots of work that is relatively of different quality and I'll speak a little bit about a research project that does that in a while as a teacher we get these these statistics at the back and they're called misfit statistics other people like to call them infit statistics but the idea is that if you fall outside of a given parameter and this is all done in the back end you can see if a judge be it a student or a teacher is relatively different to the entire cohort of judges so a good example of where this was used is a friend of mine now teaches and he created a comparative judgment session where all of the students were judges and he was the judge and the only judge misfit was him as the teacher all of the students agreed relatively speaking on the rank that the work should be in from better to worse except for him now as a teacher that's that's really useful information how is it that you are misaligning with your entire class maybe you're wrong that's something that teachers have to do maybe you have misrepresented something to students maybe the students have a misconception maybe you as a teacher have some misconceptions but either way it's a chance and an opportunity for a discussion about people's beliefs and value systems regarding the piece of work you get the same about a script or a project which is maybe there is just difficulty in figuring out where one or two scripts lie on this rank every judge might agree on the rank except for one or two scripts and those scripts will be deemed as an outlier or a misfit which again as a teacher now you get to talk to your students and say why is this so difficult to decide where it goes what makes this a good piece of work what makes this less good and so on so some cases so actual research around this and I'll be relatively tentative first of all here is a overview of studies uh, conducted between 98 and 2015 none of them were about formative assessment every single one of these studies is does it work and does it work and give us a rank that is just about the same as if we use criteria in the first place which leads to a question of if you're trying to match the rank against grades from a criterion script why did you need to move away from the criterion script if that's your goal if your goal is to get as close as possible to grades from a, from a, a rubric and so there's so few um, around formative assessment and, and the, the group from this morning that are doing the DPAC stuff have started to now for formative assessment as well I like this particular case study because so many people assume that you can't do this with maths and maths problems and I don't have a conclusive answer if you can sorry I do know that you can I don't have an answer is that if you should so the context it was maths and it was just to determine if comparative judgment is possible for maths problems they did two studies one with traditional maths problems where they used scripts from the GCSEs which are English state exams um, and then they use another set of mathematic problem solving things and I'll show you an example of both to give you the difference 23 expert judges were grading the scripts so this is an example this was in one of the scripts this comes from the GCSEs 
And the answer is how much or what fraction of volume uh, of the box is empty space. So you would find the volume of the cylinder, the volume of the sphere, subtract, and you get the empty space. And you get an absolute answer. And the scripts, there was 18 scripts, and they were all different. I've never come across this before, but the national exams, if anyone here is, is from England, please correct me if I get this wrong, but there were different awarding bodies, and they seemed to provide different mathematics scripts to students. So they had three different awarding bodies, and they had it at higher level scripts and foundation scripts. So in total, there seems to be six types of scripts, or six different scripts, and they took a different grade from these which is relatively complicated. And they just asked which candidate is the more able mathematician. And that was what the judges were asked to describe. And the judges' opinions. First of all, there was 47 pages in each script. So you're comparing 47 pages of maths against another 47 pages of maths. And they skimmed over it and felt unprofessional. So they didn't enjoy that process. Many items were too short, and they couldn't contribute. So to me, that sounds as though the experts were saying, we can't really use comparative judgment with certain maths problems. And comparing scripts from the different exams was, was difficult. So comparing a set of problems from one type of test to another was, was tough. Um, despite this, or despite this, they have 87 or 0.87 interrater reliability, which suggests 87% agreement between the judges on the rank order. There was two what they describe as marginal misfits, one for a judge, so one judge was slightly off from the from the whole group, and one script. And they correlated with a national grade of 0.91. Um, and the time it took was 105 minutes, so they're, they're divided, it's 12 judges and 11 judges. 105 minutes to make 151 judgments. So that's each judge. Each judge made 151 judgments, not as a combined total of 12. That's how I interpreted the, the paper anyway. So they made a lot of judgments. Um, I've said that entirely wrong. 12 judges made 151 judgments combined. Sorry. Um, so however, 12 goes into that, approximately 13 or so. Uh, judgments, and it took a person 105 minutes to make 13 judgments. That sounds an awful lot better. Um, and 150 judgments from the other group were made in 100 minutes. So they're approximately making um, one, one judgment every 13 minutes. Um, so depending on your intent with maths, or a, a subject, or with, with problems like that, and if you just want to use comparative judgment and see do you align with state exams, then it seems possible. But the judges will tell you that not all of the questions contribute to it and it takes a lot of time. This is the other type of problem. They, they call them the maths problem solving from this set of Boland maths tasks. They now grade it. Same judges, same two groups. But this time they were only grading students' work who had problems like this, like a word problem. They give you a picture, they tell you you have to design a bag, find out if the material for that bag can be cut out of a one by one meter square piece. Um, this time there was 18 scripts. Each of these 18 scripts, unlike the last one, had the exact same three problems. So now it's three problems, not all the other ones. Again, which candidate is more able mathematician? And they found this with in the second study, there was only four pages of maths approximately by each student, which they said was more manageable than the 47 pages, which seems to make a lot of sense. It was easier because they had all completed the same problems. And again, I thought that also made some sense. Um, and these ones were more open-ended. There was more differences in ways that the students could answer the problem. And that helped them, because then they could make a decision on a better or worse approach that the students took. Now you have 173 judges in that whole group, and 55 minutes, and so on. So they got more judgments done, in less time. And I don't know you said something, something out loud that things start to make sense, and they were only grading four sheets instead of 47, and now they got more in. So that makes sense, that there would be less. 
they had just as high intraday reliability and they still correlated with the national scores. So yes, it can be used with ads, unlike a big misconception. Whether it should is a question that I will leave up to the teachers themselves. Here's where formative assessment has been done. And this is done in America. And what they were doing, so in the context of design, and in this case, they were asking their students, and students were about ages 11 to 12, to design a brochure for, or a, a flyer or an advertisement piece of paper for traveling to another country and to advertise that country. And they had 103 students split into a control and experimental group. And what they did was the control group did five lessons and they were creating these flyers. And then they had a class where all of the students would talk to each other and give each other feedback on their work. The other group, the experimental group, used ACJ halfway through to get feedback through the ACJ process. So judgments would be made and they would write commentary and they got those comments back. So at the midway point, this was one of the pieces of work to give you a more clear example. And this was it. This is all that was being made a judgment on, and um, 100 and something of them. Or, or 57 of them in the, the group that actually used it. And this is what the, the, the experimental group did. And the students were leaving these comments. I love the colors and visuals on your page. I think you should add more information about the country and how it relates, relates to your family needs, for example. Which led to each student receiving a piece of paper with those comments from the teacher. And here's the result. So as practice is normal, is all the gray dots, and using ACJ is all of the black ones. You can see a clear difference. The, relatively speaking, the people who got to use ACJ midway, at the end of the task, did better than the group that just got feedback in their regular class. Of the 57 students, four said they didn't like it, and eight said they found it difficult to, to go through this process. And the feedback that they gave to the, the researchers was it was helpful. You're not only helping your peers, but you're gaining inspiration for ideas yourself. And it's that whole idea that you're exposed to students' work. Because I think there's often a misconception or a belief that just because your students are in the classroom together, that they are actually working and showing each other their work. Oftentimes that is fostered in classrooms, but oftentimes teachers make the assumption that that's happening because students are sitting together or working in groups. I learned the differences between good and bad brochures. It is very, very difficult to take something like this and objectively say what's good and what's bad. There are, of course, there's pieces of it. Personally, I'm colorblind. This huge amount of green is very difficult for me to look at without getting a headache. But that doesn't mean that I can speak for everybody. So everybody has their own ideas. Maybe some people like this font, others don't. Some people like the pictures, others don't. It's quite difficult to be objective about it. But it's much easier to say which one you think is better or worse. So the students got this uh, innate understanding between good and bad pieces of work through this process. Um, and they speak that you could see what other people thought about your work and not just receive one or two opinions. And this again comes from maybe the classroom climate that maybe they're only normally getting the, the opinions of people beside them, whereas now they get lots of opinions. I, I particularly like this one. I saw patterns in the feedback. So if you only get one or two pieces of feedback, versus if you get 10 pieces of feedback, it's very difficult to pick out a pattern from one or two pieces of feedback, but if 10 people tell you something, it's much clearer to understand that that's a really important piece of feedback. And people said the same thing. If I needed or wanted that same or better information, I could have asked the table mate instead of a time-consuming and an unhelpful judgment form. <laughs> I think it's very important to know that not everybody enjoys this process. Um, but it's also interesting that would the student have, and I have no answer for this, but would the student have understood the magnitude of that piece of feedback if it only came from one person, whereas if it comes from a larger group, all tell me the same thing. So that's a something that hasn't really been explored yet, is how students weight the feedback they receive from this. Another piece of work, again it's in design, but this time it's university students. Um, and I was actually involved in this one, which means I'm slightly, I feel slightly qualified to talk in front of you today. 
Um, 128 undergraduate students in Ireland, and they each did four tasks, and they were the judges themselves. They did not receive any feedback, they did not receive any grades, they just did these tasks. They did receive a grade at the very end, but we didn't use this to give them their grade. In their first task, we broke the students into quartiles. So this is the top 25% of performing students, the next 25%, and down to the bottom 25% of performing students. They, in the second task, every if we keep these same groups, and all they're doing, the only feedback they're getting is true ACJ, but they're not getting the written feedback, so they're just getting exposure to the rank. Every one of these three groups improved in the second task, except the group that, that were the best. They suddenly did worse. Then they remained stable, and at the end everyone improved. That's really difficult to interpret. One idea that we had was that while well, these people are seen exposed to work, and the likelihood of that work being better than their own work is quite large, because they perform the poorest. Whereas these people are only seeing work that's a poorer quality to their own, and then they did worse. And that came through uh, until the end when everyone improved. And it's, we can't really interpret it, but what we could say was that if you are at the top of the rank, being exposed to work that's a poorer quality, perhaps the level of feedback that you're getting from that is either maybe you overworked, so you can assign your time to other aspects, but you don't need to work that hard to be the best. Or if you're not seeing any work that's better, you're not really getting any feedback of where to improve relatively to the people at the bottom who are now seeing work that is substantially better. And so that kind of initial one was, was of interest. And the last one, this just comes from the, the judges. Eva Hartel was part of this, as were two, two American researchers. And they got American students to do a design project. And this time they got judges from America, different judges from Sweden, and different judges from the UK. They also merged two Irish judges in with the UK sample. So they created three different groups of judges. And their interest here was only to see the judges' differences. They, each student created a model. It was actually for a pill dispenser for elderly people. So each student created a model, and they also created a portfolio to explain their design. The UK and Irish judges, in terms of the prototype, valued the uniqueness of the idea and how well developed it was, or how complete the prototype looked. Whereas Swedish and USA judges only really cared about the size of it, if it was well designed, and how usable it was. So quite clearly, people from Ireland and the UK don't really care how usable their objects actually are. Um, portfolio then itself, the UK judges again the uniqueness and the degree of development. The Swedish judges value the quality and the depth of just the communication itself, not the object, but just how well it was communicated. And the USA judges, how well did the thing align with the assessment criteria itself. Which just suggests, first of all, we can have as many discussions about the validity of comparative judgment as we want. But if you have a group of judges that have a bias or a preference in any way, your rank will be associated with that bias or that group of judges. So thank you very much. Please direct all questions. If you are going to the next session by Ava, please direct all your questions to Ava. If not, to Donna, but I will also have to answer your questions. Thank you very much.